I don't know about you, but I enjoy oxymorons. Two words or phrases that are linked together with seemingly opposite meanings. Some are quite amusing. Act naturally, genuine imitation, exact estimate, airline food, <laughs> small crowd, same difference, temporary tax increase, busy doing nothing, clearly misunderstood, government organization, pretty ugly, jumbo shrimp, child proof. My favorite meaningful oxymoron is from Clara Barton, founder of the Red Cross. One time she was asked by a friend, don't you remember what that person did to you and how they hurt you? She said, yes. I distinctly remember forgetting it. Or to make oxymorons a little bit more personal, happy 70th birthday. <laughs> well, it really was. Or a short sermon. <laughs> or Christian Yankee fan. Or consider one of the great existential questions of life. Why do we sing, take me out to the ball game if we're already there? <laughs> Many oxymorons are amusing. Others are more profound. For example, today is an oxymoron. It is called both Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday. Today we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. King of the Jews, son of David, the Messiah. Yet he's riding on a humble donkey, not what we would expect from a powerful king. It is also the same day that Jesus wept. He cried at the end of his own parade. He wept over the city because the people did not recognize the time of God's coming, God's visitation. So despite this day of palm branches and celebration, this is the day when the mission of Jesus took him straight to the cross the king would not spend the next weekend in a palace, but rather a tomb. So there were cheers, but there were also tears. And so we're not sure today whether to be happy or sad, whether to sing all glory, laud, and honor, or lift high the cross. And so we sing both because it's an oxymoron kind of day. We'd rather not think about the cross on Palm Sunday, but Jesus did. It was at the cross that God's sovereign and eternal plan was fulfilled. So this king who was worshiped on Palm Sunday five days later was destined to die. And yet Jesus gave his life willingly. He said very clearly, no one takes my life away from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. You might say that in a sense, Jesus was born to die. Consider some biblical statistics. There are a total of 89 chapters in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of those 89 chapters, there are four that cover the birth of Christ, but there are 28 chapters covering the last week of Jesus' life and especially his death and resurrection. In other words, seven times more coverage in the Bible for his death than his birth. And yet, which gets the greater emphasis in our culture? Is it Christmas or Easter? On Palm Sunday, beyond the praises of the people, Jesus knew that his ultimate mission was to die on the cross because Jesus did not come to overthrow the power of Rome as many expected, but to overcome and overthrow the power of sin and death and evil, the greatest enemies of the human race. We are not saved by Palm Sunday. We are saved by the cross. What Jesus could never accomplish by his life, he accomplished by his death. And strange though it may seem, no amount of preaching, teaching, healing, and even miracles no amount of humanitarian reforms or deeds of justice and mercy, important as they are, can redeem the human heart, but only the cross. 
as Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but through every human heart. A deadly disease requires a radical cure. Only the cross can redeem the human heart. So here's the supreme oxymoron that God took the most evil event of human history and used it to accomplish the greatest good of all eternity. And we may wonder, how can the death of someone 2,000 years ago possibly affect the world or my life today? Well, because the cross is not just an historical event, it is a spiritual event. Something happened at the cross that was transcendent. The effects of the cross are not bound by time. And so as Debbie just read from 2 Corinthians, on the cross, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting our sins against us. Something happened at the cross and what happened was grace. How so? Three things about the death of Christ. Number one, it was a universal death. Jesus died for everyone. Now, sometimes people accuse Christianity of being narrow or exclusive. People say, how can you possibly subscribe to a religion that says it's the only way? But of course, the reason that Christians affirm this is because Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But then I always quickly say to those who question my faith in this regard, never forget that the one who made the most exclusive claim to salvation extended the most inclusive grace to all people. And so, for example, from the cross, Jesus said unilaterally, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The only thing that makes Jesus exclusive is if we reject his inclusive free offer of grace, but Jesus died for all. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, that God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. John 12, 32, Jesus said, if, if I be lifted up from the earth, he meant by crucifixion, I will draw all people to myself. I won't coerce people. I won't force their decision, but I will draw them. Or consider the birth announcement. I bring you good news of great joy that shall be to all the people. Today in the city of David is born a savior who's Christ the Lord. And when Jesus died on the cross, there was a sign written that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek, symbolizing every nation, every language, and every people. God so loved the world. That sounds pretty inclusive, that he gave his one and only son. Jesus died for all of us. I think of the elderly Scottish woman who walked to the doorway of her cottage, and she was just basking in the light and warmth of the sun and spontaneously she expressed her joy. She said, just think, I've got the whole sun to myself. You ever felt that way? And isn't it true that the sun is big enough that everyone in the whole world can enjoy it as though we had it to ourselves? And the same thing is true of Christ on the cross. There is enough of him to go around for all of us. And just because we have Christ does not mean that anybody else gets less of him. He died for all of us. He is the sun, S-U-N, S-O-N, who shines on everyone. And as the hymn puts it, I ask no other sunshine, but the sunshine of his face. So grace happens at the cross. How so? First of all, it's a universal death. Jesus died for everyone. Secondly, it was a redemptive death. The death of Christ was not simply an example. It was an exchange. One social and religious leader put it like this. 
This is what I used to believe. I could accept Jesus as a martyr and the embodiment of sacrifice and a divine teacher. His death on the cross was a great example to the world, but that there was anything like a mysterious or a miraculous virtue in it, my heart could not accept. With all due respect, I believe the Bible teaches that there is a mysterious, miraculous virtue in the death of Christ because what happened on the cross was not only an historical event, it was a spiritual one. This coming Wednesday, April 5th, I will celebrate the exact 50th anniversary of becoming a Christian. When on spring break of my sophomore year in college, a Methodist minister said to me in a personal counseling session, one sentence that changed my life. Steve, the cross of Jesus Christ is a mystery and you don't have to understand everything about it for its power to work in your life. That single sentence unlocked my heart and enabled me to believe. And basically he was saying, grace happens at the cross because the cross is a redemptive event. It is not simply an example, though it is that, but more than an example, it is an exchange. The language of scripture is that Jesus died for us that he died on behalf of us, even that he died in our place. That is an exchange. That's an exchange of grace. And so in Isaiah 53, it says that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Do you hear the exchange? Or listen carefully, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, that is Christ, who had no sin to become sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. My sin for his righteousness. Righteousness is being right with God. It is being fully forgiven, fully accepted because of this exchange of grace. John Stott put it like this. The essence of sin is us substituting ourselves for God. The essence of salvation is God substituting himself for us. I exchange my sin for his righteousness. In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis put it like this. The central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. A good many theories have been held as to how this works. What all Christians agree upon is that it does work. A person can eat their dinner without understanding exactly how food nourishes them. And a person can accept what Christ has done without knowing exactly how it works. Indeed, that person would certainly not know how it works until he or she has accepted it. So the death of Christ is first of all a universal death. He died for all of us. Secondly, it's a redemptive death, not simply an example, but an exchange of grace at the cross. And then finally, it's a personal death in that Jesus invites from each of us a personal response. Grace happens at the cross, but we need to receive it. Jesus is the king, but he does not force himself upon us. He waits to be invited. I love the story that is told of an exhibition in England. When it officially opened, the uh, queen made a tour of the various presentations. And at one point, she came upon one exhibitor who was slouched in his chair absolutely sound asleep. And the author writes, there was a moment of consternation while everyone watched to see what the queen would do. She paused for a moment and then with a smile, she went on to the next exhibit and she said, royalty does not force itself on anyone. Likewise, the royalty of Jesus Christ does not force himself on anyone. He waits to be invited 
like that thief on the cross next to Jesus. Remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. That's grace, and it happened on the cross, but we need to receive it. Maybe a baseball illustration would help. Come down here closer to the kids so they can see it. So here's a baseball card that is worth a lot of money, a whole lot of money. And um, it's actually from 1983, and it's called a Baltimore Orioles Future Stars card. Now, if you talk to either of these guys on the end, Bobby Bonner or Jeff Schneider, they would say, wow, have you ever seen my card? It is worth a whole lot of money. And yet that's really strange. In fact, it's amazing because the fact is they were not very good ball players. Bob, Bobby Bonner at shortstop hit no home runs in his career, had eight RBIs lifetime and a 194 average. That was it. Jeff Schneider, the pitcher, pitched in a total of 11 games, 24 innings. He never got a victory or a win as a pitcher. And yet they're telling us that, have you ever seen my card? It is worth so much money. How can that be? Well, it's because of the guy in the middle whose name is Cal Ripken. Oh, I know him. Do you know him? Yes. <laughs> Cal Ripken. He, you know, two, he played in 2,632 consecutive games, 431 lifetime homers, 1,595 lifetime RBIs. You all know that because you know the books of the Bible. <laughs> but see, the reason that their card is worth so much is because of this fellow in the middle. And you might say that because he's in the middle, it's almost like his statistics became theirs. Okay? So we're like Bobby Bonner and Jeff Schneider on either side. Spiritually, our statistics aren't so good. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you know what? Jesus is in the middle. And when we put our faith and our trust in him, then his statistics become ours. His righteousness becomes ours instead of our sin. And then we've got something better than a card that's worth a lot of money. We receive the gift of eternal life. God so loved the world. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Let's pray together. It is my card. I'll show it to you later. Yeah. <laughs> Gracious God, we bow before the king. We humbly confess our need. We admit our sins. And Lord, whether for the first time or as an act of renewal, we put our faith and trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we pray that we might always be on his card. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.